dual pathways to happiness. Most people are endowed with a starting capital of both craving and wholesome enthusiasm. Those leaders in society are those who act as mentors, Kalyanamita, virtuous friends, should understand this fact and help others to both promote wholesome desire and to regulate or subdue craving. At the very least, people should prevent the undercurrent of craving from becoming an overwhelming force. In regard to basic wholesome desire, Chanda, most people wish for their environment to be well ordered tidy and clean. When they encounter a beautiful natural setting they rejoice. They want their surroundings to be in a state of completeness. They want people, animals, trees and plants to be healthy and vibrant. In the same vein people want their own bodies to be healthy, strong and clean and to exist in a state of completeness. These are useful examples for distinguishing between Chanda and Tanha. At the same time, most people wish to gratify their desires by way of contact with appealing and agreeable visual forms, fragrances, sounds, tastes and tactile objects. These are collectively referred to as material objects. Uh, misha or sense objects, karma, because these sense objects rely on a coarse form of contact and often involved strong stimulation, they can be very seductive. Developing a thorough understanding so as not to be led astray by these enticements requires repeated emphasis. Let us compare these two kinds of desire in more depth. As mentioned above, wholesome enthusiasm chanda begins with a pleasure and contentment in seeing things exist in a state of well-being and completeness. If the object or person in question is not yet in a state of completeness or is in a state of only partial completeness, one wishes to act in order to fulfill this completeness. It is at this stage of wanting to act that one reaches the true essence of Chanda, which is referred to as desire, as the wish to act, Katu Kamyata Chanda. The unwholesome form of desire, craving, on the other hand, manifests as a lust for the five sense objects in order to achieve gratification by way of consuming things. Craving is the desire for consumption. This is a desire to obtain and to acquire solely for one's own benefit. Here is where a crucial distinction between these two kinds of desire is evident. When craving arises, it is by definition accompanied by a presumed owner, desirer, claimant or consumer, i.e. by someone who acquires, seizes and consumes, who wants to get things for the sake of the so-called owner or consumer. This is the birth of a sense of self. Wholesome enthusiasm functions differently. It is accompanied by a delight and satisfaction in witnessing the goodness and completeness of an object. This delight arises without needing to do anything. If the object is not yet in a state of completeness, there is a desire for it to reach this state. This desire for completeness generates another level of desire, which is the wish to act to bring about completeness. In the case that one does not know how to bring about such completeness, the natural causal process advocates how to respond. 
the desire for completeness on the inquiry into how to bring this about leads to a desire for knowledge, a yearning to understand. <coughs> the above explanations indicate the breadth of meaning of the term chanda. First, there is a delight in the goodness, beauty and completeness of an object or person. Second, there is a wish for this thing or person to remain healthy, complete or happy. <coughs> Third, in the case that this thing or person has not yet reached such a state of completion, there is a wish to act in order to help bring about this completion and fourth, there is a desire to gain the necessary knowledge required to help bring about completion. The first distinction here is that wholesome enthusiasm wishes for something to exist in a natural state of fulfilment and completion. When one encounters something or someone in this state of completion, one immediately experiences happiness and satisfaction. For instance, when one delights in the beauty of nature. This differs from craving, which must wait for gratification until an object can be consumed. <coughs> Another essential distinction is that throughout the process of wholesome enthusiasm, there is desire without the birth of one who desires, or the birth of an agent who must act. This differs from the process of craving, which requires a sense of self, of a consumer, an owner, a controller, etc. If while engaging with something by way of wholesome enthusiasm, a fixed sense of identity arises, this indicates that defilements associated with self-view have infiltrated the mind. A subtle defilement that tends to arise in this context is conceit mana, the wish for self-importance. The essence of chanda is a desire to act. For this reason, this term is defined as katu kamyata chanda, desire as a wish to act. A frequent definition of chanda is kandoti katu kamyata chando. Chanda is the aspiration expressed as a desire to act in order for something to reach a state of virtue or completion. This point needs to be reiterated because it is the starting point of human spiritual development. If we are endowed with wholesome enthusiasm, we will rejoice and feel at ease. When we see that our house or monastery is clean and tidy, if it is dirty or messy, we will want to clean it. We will grab a broom and sweep the floor or the grounds. If we do not know how to sweep, we will want to learn and will study the best methods of sweeping. We will become experts at sweeping and experience joy while sweeping. <coughs> This is an example of spiritual training and of how wholesome enthusiasm is the starting point of spiritual development. <coughs> With craving, however, this process of training does not begin. When craving arises, one wishes to obtain something in order to consume it. With consumption, the process ends. One has no wish to improve oneself. Wholesome, des wholesome desire in relation to others. So far the discussion on desire has focused on people's work and activities as well as touching upon the relationship to one's environment. For this discussion to be complete, however, one must also look at wholesome desire in relation to other human beings. As mentioned above, wholesome desire chanda is the wish for all things to exist in a state of goodness and completion. This desire extends also to all sentient beings. 
as well wishing towards all beings, beginning with one's human companions, is the desire for others to be well, to flourish, to be healthy and strong, and to experience joy and happiness. Interaction with other human beings is a vital part of people's lives. Likewise, wholesome desire in relation to other human beings, and indeed to all beings, holds a special significance in people's lives. This well-wishing or desire for goodness in relation to other people and other living creatures has exceptional attributes. Distinct from the desire for inanimate things to reach a state of wellness and completion. For this reason, there are several terms used to represent chanda in this context, depending on specific circumstances. Instead of using the term chanda to designate wholesome desire, wish or wish, other human beings, the following four terms are used. <coughs> 1. Metta, loving kindness. Under normal circumstances, if one has wholesome desire, a sense of well-wishing towards other people, one wants them to be bright and physically healthy and to experience happiness. This is a basic initial form of well-wishing. It is a desire focusing on another person or a living creature. It is not tied up with personal concerns. 2. Karuna Compassion If one encounters another person or a living creature who is unhealthy, debilitated, anguished or troubled, or who has fallen on bad times, one wishes for him or her to be free from such suffering destitution, misery or illness. 3. Medita, appreci appreciative joy. If another person prospers, a child grows up to blossom and thrive. Someone is healthy, physically beautiful and attractive. Someone reaches some form of true success, etc. One rejoices in his or her accomplishments. For Upeka Equanimity. In some circumstances, another person is able to take res self responsibility, or else it is suitable and appropriate for him or her to take such responsibility. In such cases, one should allow him or her to remain independent without interference. For example, two parents may be watching their toddler learn how to walk. Wishing for the child to grow and succeed, they watch from a distance without intruding. They do not get caught up with worry and constantly cradle the child. The desire here for a state of wellness is a desire for people's success, goodness and rectitude. One wishes for them to abide in uprightness, correctness and safety, for them to exist in truth and righteousness. To enable this, one refrains in these circumstances from interfering. Wholesome desire, chanda, is the catalyst for these four mind states. In other words, wholesome desire expresses itself in four different contexts. 1. A sense of well-wishing when people abide in a normal state of happiness equals metta. 2. A sense of well-wishing when people fall on hard times, a wish for them to be released from suffering and to arrive at a state of well-being equals karuna. 3. A sense of well-wishing when people reach success and accomplishment. A wish for them to achieve even greater prosperity equals mudita. 4. A sense of well-wishing when people have the opportunity to exercise self-responsibility. A wish for them to abide in integrity, uprightness, security and righteousness equals upeka. 
Most people only consider the first three kinds of well-wishing, but this is insufficient because three factors are still confined to the domain of feeling. Although these feelings, sentiments or emotions are exalted and highly cultivated, they are not yet complete. Only the fourth factor brings completion. <coughs> In brief, if people only possess wholesome sentiments, no matter how elevated or sublime these may be, this is inadequate. These sentiments fulfill personal attributes, but they are not yet linked with truth, with Dhamma. Although these people are good, they may not yet be correct. <coughs> to realize the truth, to reach true correctness, to dispel suffering and to realize perfect happiness, one must also possess knowledge. Technically speaking, completing the cultivation of the mind, chitta, is insufficient. Factors of the mind or the heart cannot by themselves bring about liberation. One must complete the cultivation of wisdom, panya, which is the decisive factor for liberation and mental perfection. The first three forms of well-wishing are confined to factors of the mind. The fourth factor involves wisdom, which prompts true application of the mind and leads to liberation. <coughs> in, some, although, in some, although people may possess positive emotions, they need wisdom to regulate, refine and elevate these emotions. The fourth factor of equanimity constitutes this link with wisdom. If people lack wisdom, they are unable to solve life's problems. Even if they are possessed with virtues and wholesome sentiments, they may apply these incorrectly and perform unskillful actions. Say a thief steals $2,000, from one perspective he has reached success. He has obtained money and experiences some happiness. How should one respond to this? In accord with the factor of appreciative joy, one rejoices in his happiness. Yet this is incorrect. Here one runs counter to true dharma practice by getting stuck on the level of emotions. Although the emotions are positive, they may lead to trouble. People may then condone stealing, causing all sorts of problems for society. Here is where wisdom brings about an integration and balance of the mind. The wish here referred to as equanimity of Pekka is for other people to possess rectitude and correctness. Equanimity as an expression of wholesome desire chanda is the wish for others to be well and complete. In order to reach completion, people must align themselves with dhamma, with righteousness. One abides in a state of equanimity in order to allow correctness and righteousness to proceed according to the laws of nature. The first three factors of kindness, compassion and appreciative joy protect the individual. The fourth factor of equanimity also safeguards the truth. If someone else commits a breach of truth, then one should uphold and protect the truth, uphold justice and probity. Fulfillment is reached with equanimity, which is an emotion co connected to wisdom. Equanimity acts to balance these four divine abidings, Brahma Vihara. According to, the Buddhist, according to the Buddhist teachings, these four factors are indeed divine forces. That is, they represent Brahma, the highest divinity, and protect the world.